thanks so much for stopping by and uh, checking out this sermon video. Just want to encourage you as you listen to this sermon uh, that this is just a supplement to your faith, to your walk with Jesus. Don't rely on this solely. I just encourage you to get involved in a local church if you uh, already are not. If you are looking for a local church, I'd encourage you to check out Center Point Church. Uh, we'd love to see you uh, be a part of our community. Uh, we have different groups that meet as well uh, throughout the week, Bible studies that uh, you can be a part of. Uh, as well, maybe it's on your heart that you'd like to help us in some way financially. Uh, a lot of man hours go into making our videos, into our production on Sunday morning. And if that's on your heart, check out centerpointchurch.ca and you can see how you could help us as well. You can check out our Facebook page, Center Point Church. Uh, like and follow us. Uh, God bless. started a series called Unshakable. We're still walking through that uh, in the book of 1 John. Today we're in 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 7 to 16. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 4. And we're continuing to make our way through this book. And we've come sort of to, I'll just say, uh, the climax sort of of the passage. Uh, John has a lot more to say, but he's come back in the passage and we're going to read today on the subject of love as a test of authentic Christian experience and profession uh, for at least the third time in the book. Uh, had a Bible school teacher who always said, uh, Howie, if someone says something to you three times, look in the mirror uh, because they're probably making a point, right? Uh, John now, for the third time, is going to talk about love within the Christian community. And he's combined it with the idea of rightly believing in the truth of God's word, in who Jesus is. And last week when we were together, we were looking at verses 1 to 6 of chapter 4, and we saw this emphasis again being on the confession that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He's from God. And we see that in verse 2 of 1 John 4. And now John immediately moves to the subject of love again. The expression of self-giving commitment to one another in the church. Of caring for one another in tangible ways. Seeking to advance the best interest of one another, even at our own expense, in the bonds of Christian fellowship. Now, why would he move from this discussion of faith, our believing the truth of God's word about who Jesus is, why does John move after that immediately to the topic of love? How are they connected? If you look back at chapter 3, verse 23, you're going to see one way that they're connected. And here's what it says in chapter 3, Verse 23, he summarized the New Testament call of the Christian life in this way. We believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Now, isn't it interesting that John summarized the call of the Christian life, the call of the Christian experience, to believing in who Jesus is in accordance with Scripture, and then loving one another in the bonds of Christian fellowship in accordance with the scripture. And he does it there in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. Then we hit chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. And it's sort of an elaboration on that point. It's an outline. It's a brief summary in a very short phrase uh, backing up chapter 3, verse 23. And so John has repeatedly in his book being concerned not only to call us to faith. So John's focused on calling us to faith in Jesus, but he also wants to call us to trust in him, not only to call us to belief in who God says Jesus Christ is and what the Bible says about Jesus. So in calling us to belief in who Jesus claimed to be, John's going to back that up now with love in the Christian community. So he's been concerned, center point, to call us to this mutual self-giving as Christians. Denying ourselves, which is hard to do, right? Because 
I'll just say, to deny ourselves for the sake of another is a discipline we really have to work in our life. Like loving one another despite our natural differences. Like you're going to meet some people who you will go, like I just naturally don't get along with them. Or naturally I just, they have this vibe maybe that just sort of throws me off. And that's going to happen from time to time in the church. These differences arise between us as believers. However, we need to love across the obstacles and the boundaries. And John is constantly calling us to that. Like, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but when God wants to get your attention, he does things basically over and over. Ever go through a week and maybe a verse just keeps coming and you finish the the week and you're like, man, I've seen that verse like four times this week. Or maybe there's this individual who's sort of been driving you crazy and you run into them like three times during the week and God's like not letting it rest. Ever have those moments? Yeah, thank you. Uh, And he's trying to get us to go, okay, you need to work through that. You need to extend this in the Christian community. Go across the boundaries and love. And in the passage today, we're going to see perhaps more clearly than anywhere else in this book how those things are not only parallel in John's argument, but you can't separate them. They're connected in his argument. So for John, here's what he's getting at. You cannot love without the truth and the truth is unto our love of one another so you cannot love without the truth so often today there's a wedge that's driven between those two things and people will say oh (laughs) and people will say oh we need to stop talking about all this doctrine Uh, I've been doing ministry now for Uh, Yeah, it's crazy, 16 and a half years full time. And uh, do you know the biggest criticism I've gotten is, uh, Howie, you just need to stop talking about doctrine and theology so much and just love. And I'm like, excuse me? What do you mean? Well, we need to put aside doctrine because doctrine divides. And what we need is love. And I'm like, okay, I I get the love part. However, love and doctrine go together. Love and theology go together. So, as John is concerned here, he's basically saying you cannot love like God calls you to love if you do not embrace the doctrine of God's word. So they go together. And the doctrine of God's word has not completed its purpose in your heart until you have a love for God and you have a love for your brothers and sisters and a love for your neighbor like he himself in his own heart has expressed in the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. You cannot love if you don't know Christ as Savior the way the Bible calls us to love. That's what John is getting at. You need to know the truth of God's word. And the doctrine of God's word has not completed its purpose in your heart until you have that type of love. So for John, the truth sort of, and I'll just say the truth and love go like hand in glove. You can't separate the two. There's doctrine and theology and love. They go together. They cannot be separated. And if they are separated, they will damage each other. Because you need both. So 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. We'll read it and then we'll pray. This is what it says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but he loved us and he sent his son uh, to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, and if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. 
And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We'll pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would make your word to be fruitful to our hearts and our lives. God, we, we are a people who are just so quick to speak and slow to listen, always in a rush. Make us willing, patient, obedient hearers of your word today. And God, I pray by your spirit that you would work this truth deep into our hearts, that we might be changed from the inside out, that our whole life would be transformed by the gospel of Jesus and our life would reflect that change. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So the apostle John is known as the apostle of love. And we've been reminded over and over in this book and it's a subject that John just can't get away from. Like, he keeps circling around to love all the time. And we're perhaps thinking to ourselves, no wonder in church history, uh, when you read through it, you find that the historians have passed down uh, this, uh, I'll just say, this item about John, that as he got older, when he couldn't make it really to church without his friends carrying him in, all he could do would stand up front, sit up front, I mean, and say, beloved, let us love one another. That's at the end of his life. So John is known as the apostle of love. And I want to say there's a specific reason why this message of love is on John's heart. Uh, it's not just because John's sappy or some sentimental guy who likes rom-coms, right? Like, that's not where John's at. He's not going, I, I love Sleepless in Seattle, and when Harry met Sally, he's, he's not in touch with his sensitive side. He's just been transformed by Jesus, and he loves. He loves the church. He loves the people. And if there's a specific situation in the Christian church in his day, he's addressing it, but I'd say there's a situation in the church in all days, which requires this emphasis on the love of God and the truth of God for the life of the church. So in John's day, there was a group in the church who believed they were the super-duper Christians. They thought they were the elevated Christians. They separated themselves. They put themselves on a different level and they were teaching other Christians that the way to be a super Christian was to be introduced to the secret knowledge which could only be taught by one of these super teachers in the church and these super Christians and those being taught were were introduced to a secret knowledge and uh, they were being told you can live at a higher plane if you come and learn this teaching. And the result of this particular teaching was not only that there were people in the church that were embracing this doctrine, which was untrue, uh, they were also embracing the fact uh, that was being taught by the false teachers that Jesus was not man, that's what the teachers were teaching, and John is rebuking those false teachers, uh, but they're embracing these truths, denying Jesus, they're thinking uh, denying that Jesus was a man, they're thinking they're better than other Christians, that uh, basically they're living on this higher plane, and as a result, there's division in the church because of the teaching. That's what's happening. Now, you can imagine, if somebody's been introduced to a secret knowledge, a secret teaching that nobody else knows and they've been told congratulations you're now one of the Christians who are on a higher plane uh, you're now one of the super Christians uh, a spirit of pride can arise this happens in churches all over uh, there are people in our churches who might have a lot of Bible knowledge who think that they are super Christians they might not come out and say it 
but they've placed themselves as the mature believers. This still goes on today. There are churches that would teach if you have this experience, for example, with the Holy Spirit, then you're an elite Christian. You're on a higher plane. So this stuff isn't uh, old. It still goes on. It's just repackaged in our churches today. In fact, we know that there was enough division in this church that John's addressing that some people were leaving the church. And he addresses that in 1 John chapter 2. And John says, I can tell you that that teaching is wrong in its effect. Meaning this, its effect has been to divide the body of Christ. The teaching has divided and set people against one one another. Not to edify, not to encourage, not to build up. It's not like a brother and a sister in the Lord, maybe like for example, this week you've read a few verses and you're like, oh, those verses are so good. And you take them and you share them with a brother or sister in the Lord to encourage them. That's not what this church was doing. They were dividing over the teaching. So there's a difference between using scripture to edify, teaching to edify and build up. But there's this spirit here of, I now have the truth. I now went through the initiations, and now I'm on a higher, deeper deeper spiritual level, which only I know. Uh, I remember going to Bible camp, uh, and it's sort of like Emmanuel Bible camp. At your fifth year, you had to get to year five. They gave you this sort of private breakfast, and then they were... Every year you got a, like a handkerchief to put around your neck and it showed the, the, what year. So like green was year one, yellow was year two. But year five was this black one. And at the end of the week on Saturday, they give you this private breakfast and then they'd sew the arrowhead with the Camp Emanuel logo on it and they would tell you the secret. I had to wait five years. And at this secret breakfast, they were like, make sure you tell no one because we have people coming up. We have boys and girls coming up who are going to learn this deep, deep truth. I'm like, this better be good. I've waited five years. This is amazing breakfast. And then they take us out into the woods and walk us through a trail. And I don't think... This will spoil it for anyone in this room today. But I sat there, and at the end, they said, all right, here's the secret. The CE of Camp Emmanuel stands for Christ Eternal. I'm like, that's it? I've been coming five years? You guys just made that up. CE, of course, you're a Christian camp. Five years, and now... I can't tell anyone. It was like this big buildup, and then it was like, I have no pride in that at all. I'm not going to, I won't ruin it, but I, that's one of the main reasons I was coming. It wasn't that spectacular. And I'm thinking even in this church as they're getting these sort of deeper, what they think are deeper scriptural truths, I'm going, in the long run, those things don't even line up. At least Christ eternal lines up with the Bible and it's all good. But I'm going, this is what John is addressing in the body, like people thinking they're higher than others because of their knowledge or because of this teaching. And it's bringing division in the church. And John wants to say real biblical truth as opposed to the false truth to the false prophets. He's basically saying real biblical truth will issue forth in love. That's how you see it play out. It'll issue forth in love. That is a real tangible care for one another in the Christian community. It won't lead to division. It'll lead to greater unity. It's not that there won't be obstacles. It's not that there won't be problems in the church. It's not that there won't be division at times. John wouldn't have to talk about it if there was no division. Of course that stuff's going to happen because a lot of issues, even in the church, is just, as I mentioned, personality conflicts. 
not knowing how to read people, or maybe some are a little more sensitive than others, and that's fine, but that's sort of the divisions and the obstacles we face in the church, and those problems are normal. But it's the people of God here, as they grow in a greater knowledge of the truth of God, they actually have a deeper desire to encourage one another, to take care of one another. Did you ever notice that when you're growing in Christ, you actually care to see others edified, built up in their faith, that you want to be that encourager? You want to seek the best interest of one another, to take care of one another in a time of need? That's the beauty of the Christian community. There will be greater unity, which results from the truth. So hear me, the more you get into God's word, the more you will love the body of Christ. The more you will care for people, as opposed to disunity, which comes from uh, this false truth that is being taught. This is why you need community. Now, I want to do this without... I'm not here to put guilt and shame. I, I love you. I love Center Point Church. But one of the things that we are really bad at at Center Point is community. And I say that over the years. Uh, we create opportunities for people to come together, to connect, to hopefully grow in love and get to know each other. But the danger in our culture is church is more something that we go to. It's more of a, I did my Sunday thing. But biblical church is people. You can't get by it. Church isn't a building. It's not a location. Church is people. People who are saved by Jesus. So the church is a body of people that have been changed by the gospel of Christ, who now grow together in that truth, but they love the community. So hear me out on this. There was a season at Center Point Church in Charlottetown where we had a ton of young adults, and we'd do connect group, and we'd have like 30 to 40 young adults. Now, some of them were there with motives of, I just want a boyfriend and a girlfriend, and as soon as they got one, they were out the door. That happens. Some, though, connected in community. Some started to uh, thrive in the life of community. But what I've seen over the years at Center Point is it's sort of maybe, I don't know, I got other things. So right now, our connect groups throughout the week, we have two, reach probably 12 people in Charlottetown. 12 people who make that a priority. I'm just saying that is a weakness. We're not connecting as a community. We're not really maybe getting to know people and caring for people and seeing where the needs are because we need this in our churches. We need people who come together, who connect together, who grow together. So it's more than Sunday mornings. Like if you're just living off of this, you're anemic. Do you know what that is? You're low on iron physically, but spiritually, this is just weak. You need community. You need other people to speak into your life. You need to be there to speak into others' lives. And if this is all you're getting, it's sort of a challenge to go, can you go deeper? Can you go deeper into community? Can it be deeper than a Sunday morning could you build others up? Could you get to know others? Could you open up your life and share that as well? Think about it. I'm just saying, uh, nine years, and still our church hasn't caught on the need for community. Pray about it. Ask God. Because the heart is, we'd love to have other connect groups. Maybe Thursday night or Monday doesn't work, but hey, we could have one Wednesday people want to get involved, if they want to get into community. What I've seen is people like it for a while, and then they're gone. Say that is a challenge. 
because my heart is to see you grow together in Christ. Now, moving on, because that maybe makes some of us uncomfortable. John keeps circling back to love because it's one of the ways that he can show the ones who are loving Christ, following Christ, it's one of the ways he can show them false teaching. He says, see that teaching over there? That led to disunity. Not the kind of disunity that happens when godly, Bible-believing people, uh, it's against their conscience. Like, I get it. There's some teaching where I would go, I can't sit under that teaching, I can't be for that teaching, and I need to remove myself from that teaching. But this isn't where John is basically going. That's not the kind of division that John is warning us about. The kind of division that is brought about by people claiming to have a truth which is not revealed in the word of God or which is beyond the word of God, which takes them deeper into the deep things of God and the result is disunity, division, fracturing in the life of the local congregation. So John says, look, love is a test of truth. If you love, if you've been changed by Jesus, you will love the body of Christ. And the fact that this so-called truth that these false teachers are bringing, it's leading to the division in the congregation. It's, it's hurting the church. So there's this practical reason why John keeps coming back to love, but there's a standing reason why we need this message in the Christian church. And that is, center point, we're still sinners. That's why we need this reminder over and over. We're still sinners. We hurt one another in the Christian church. We let one another down in the Christian church. We offend one another in the Christian church. We're really different, aren't we? No, we're not. We still battle with sin. The Lord brings together all sorts of people into the Christian community. And we don't naturally have this sort of uh, love for one another just because we're brought into a local body. And there's every manner of challenge to living together in love in the Christian church. It's hard to live together in family. Can we agree? Family is wonderful, but at times it drives you up the wall, right, to be in family. And when you live together in a family, in close proximity, you step on one another's toes. You get on one another's nerves. The closer you are, the deeper the wounds can be and the more powerful the division. Center point. It's like that in the Christian church. We're like a family. And we let one another down sometimes. Sometimes we offend one another. There are divisions, hear me, in every church. Every church has it. People who don't want to see that person coming down the hall. Or that Christian when you're at the store coming down the aisle that you avoid at all cost. When you see them, you head the other direction. Maybe it was a business deal that went bad. Maybe it was conflict with the individual and you're in the same church. Uh, but that doesn't last long because the Charlottetown shuffle happens. You just go to another church. And then there's sinners in that church. And they offend you. So you just go to the next one and the next one. And uh, that's what we call as pastors the Charlottetown Shuffle. I meet with a group of pastors every month. So when we're offended or when we're hurt or we don't like conflict, we just go to another church. Can I just tell you, that's not a good habit to get into. 
because people are still sinners wherever you go. I had someone I remember pastoring in Georgetown, and they were like, Howie, we're a sick church. And I went, all churches are sick. Thank goodness for Jesus. Jesus is the one who can build that bridge, who helps us to love. And John is concerned here that the truth, he's concerned that the truth is going to build us up to have a love which overcomes those kinds of things in the body of Christ. Like, I have friends in my life right now, theologically, we differ on some minor things. But man, we're good friends. We have coffee together and I'll have, I'm more reformed in my thinking. My friend's more Arminian in his thinking. He's like, Howie, when are you going to come back over? <laughs> and I'm like, haven't you thought that God predestined me to bring you over here to this side? And we're not hurting each other. Like, we're, we're friends. We love Jesus. We love the gospel. I know that if my friend dies or if I die, we're both going to the same Jesus. Like, we love him. Our lives are about him. I don't have to divide with him over that. You can have people in your life that you disagree with theologically and you can still get along. You can have people in your life who are totally different. Like I go down east uh, uh, to like where I grew up, Georgetown area. I sit with a guy, he's close to 70 now, and his passion is gardening. And I'll sit with him and we'll have coffee and he'll talk to me about gardening. I don't care about gardening. I really don't. But I listen to him. I ask questions. We're friends. We get along. And then I talk to him about workouts. And he's 70. He could care less about that. But we still have these conversations because that's what we do in the church. Even though we're different, doesn't mean we can't be friends. Doesn't mean we can't love in Christ. Sit with a bunch of guys who are around my age and they just love video games. And I'm like, I don't play video games. Like, if it has more than two buttons, I'm out. I can't multitask. That's my problem. Like, God's given Howie McMaster a small plate. And he said, Howie, manage that small plate. And I go, for your glory, absolutely. So every morning I have eggs and bacon and I cook my eggs first because I can't cook the bacon at the same time because I burn either the eggs or the bacon. So God's like, you need help. So I'll give you some wisdom. Just cook one and then go to the other. And I'm like, thank you, God. That, that was very good. But I have friends who are right into video games, etc. And I'm like, I could care less. I just found out about Fortnite a few months ago. And man, they've been playing it for a year. See, John is talking about our loving one another. You may want to allow your eyes right now to fall upon 1 John chapter 2, verses 8 and 10. I want to read those to you. So 1 John chapter 2, verses 8. And 8 to 10, this is what we read. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. John says, look, we should love one another because this is the commandment of God. And he even says, look, I'm not telling you something new. I'm telling you something old. But then he comes back and he says, but it's really new. Confused yet? I'm telling you something that's old. However, it's new. And he's not contradicting himself. He's just bringing out the very thing that Jesus brought out in the upper room. It's this, that the new commandment to love one another was really not a new commandment. It had been God's commandment from the beginning. But Jesus is going to show how it was to be done in a way beyond which we've ever been shown. So it's going to make it new. 
A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, it's that phrase that's new. The commandment to love one another comes right out of Leviticus chapter 19, but the commandment to love one another as I have loved you comes out of the cross. Okay, this changes everything now. Jesus says, now this is how I want you to love one another. I want you to be willing to lay down your life for the sake of the brothers and sacrificially laying down your life. Yes. For all people in the body of Christ. That's what John is saying. I want you to seek the kingdom and its righteousness first. I want you to die to self. I want you to give yourself away. I want you to serve your brothers and sisters. I want you to serve like I have served. That's where Jesus goes. And John points to that in 1 John 2. He says, that's a motivation. That's the motivation for our loving. Jesus is following of that great command to love one another. Jesus giving us that great commandment. So remember, John had been there. John was one of his disciples. Beloved, love one another as I have loved you. By this, the world will know that you are mine if what? You love one another. John heard those words, and then he uses it as motivation in 1 John chapter 2. Then if you turn forward to 1 John chapter 3 and you look at verses 14 and 16, here's what you'll see. John says that love is also an evidence that we are a new creation, that God has done a work in our hearts, that he's given us new life in Christ. And he says, because love is the evidence that a person is new, has been recreated, has been reborn, has been regenerated, has been made a new creation. He's a new person walking in the newness of life in Jesus. Because of that, we ought to love one another. So if you go, I've been changed by Jesus, you ought to love one another. John says, loving one another is an evidence that God has done a work of grace in your hearts. Do you do that? And he doesn't end there because in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12, which we read today especially, uh, we see uh, it all the way to verse 16. He says, look, we ought to love one another because God is love and he is showing love in the giving of his son. In other words, he says, we ought to love one another because of who God is and because of what he's done. So John argues we ought to love one another because it's God's command. Jesus has shown us how to keep the commandment. And we ought to love one another because it's the evidence that God has done a work of grace in us. That God has changed our lives. But we also ought to love one another because God himself is love and because he has loved us in the giving of his only son, Jesus Christ. So his argument, you see, they're building. They're building. Here's where he goes, verses 7 and 8. Because God is the source of all real and true love, we are to love one another. He says these four things in the passage that we need to pay very close attention to. So let's look at them very quickly. In verses 7 and 8, he points uh, us to this divine source of love. And this is his first argument in the passage for why we ought to love one another. Notice he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. That's his argument to start. God himself is the source of real love. When you see people really and truly loving one another as God intends in his word, John is saying, you can bet that God is at work because God is the source of love. And John is making this argument. Because God is the source of all real and true love, we ought to love one another. John is saying that all true love flows from God. All true love derives from God. And of course, John isn't just talking about an emotion here. He's not talking about a feeling. He's not talking about those warm, fuzzy feelings about someone else. He's talking about real, 
tangible self-commitment to others. Like sometimes you have a deep commitment to a person who you don't have that strong and emotional bond to. So if your marriage is healthy, you have a stronger emotional bond with your husband and wife than you do with many people that you are called to love in the Christian church. And John is calling us, though, to that self denying, self-giving commitment to one another's best interests. Isn't that crazy? Like, think about that. Doesn't that challenge you? If you're married in this room today, that love you have for your wife, for your husband, that love should also go to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. That self-sacrificing commitment to the body of Christ. To look out for one another, to care for one another, to encourage one another, to help one another. And John's saying that kind of love only flows from God. You can't give yourself away, John is saying, unless God has filled you up with his love first. Because he is the divine source of love. Uh, Back when I was a child, uh, Whitney Houston sang a song that was called, the greatest love of all. And a few years ago now, Lady Gaga sang, I was born this way. And uh, when you listen to many of our songs of the day, uh, be it pop songs, whatever we want to call them, they are all about learning to love, guess who? Yourself. Can I just tell you, we don't need any help in that area. You love yourself. Just letting you know. Like, you don't need Whitney Houston to sing to you about loving yourself. You already do. You got up. You probably fed yourself, dressed yourself, right? Got all decked out today for yourself. We love ourselves. So that's not the issue in our culture. Like, I've heard our culture try to tell us, like, learn to love yourself, then you'll be able to love others. I'm like, we already love ourselves. Like, can we sing that song? I'm in love with myself. We are in love with ourselves. It's not popular in 2019, but man, we love ourselves. And they're singing these songs, and and the philosophy in our world is that way, love yourself, because if you don't, you really can't love others. And John's logic is polar opposite. John's logic is this, unless you have been filled up with the love of God, you can't love others. That's his logic. Unless God's love has filled you, it will be impossible for you to love others. Because there is no human love on this earth that can fill up the void that is in us. So if you're here and you're going, I just need love, you need God's love. And if you're here and you know Jesus is Savior and you're going, I just need love, you already have it. It's God's love. Let that fill your life. Let that cover your life. Because we cannot give ourselves away even unto death unless we have been filled up to the brim with the love of God. And John's reminding us of this here. God is the source of love. God is the source of our ability to give ourselves away in love. Like where we see real love at work, we can best believe that God the Spirit is at work as well. And John is suggesting that really only Christians can properly imitate and reflect the love which flows from God. Did you get that? Only Christians, only Christ followers can show that love to a dark, lost world. John is just telling us that a real knowledge of God, if we know that God is the source of love, a real knowledge of God will lead us to love God and our neighbor. It just will. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul and John are lock and step together. They don't go against each other. They're in this together. 
And John is saying here that if you know who God is and if you know that he is the fountain of all love, then it will show in the way you love your brothers and sisters and your neighbor. Then we hit the second thing, verses 9 to 11. Because God has manifested his love in the giving of his own son, we are to love one another. Second point, we are not only to love because God is the source of all love, we are to love because God has shown his love in the giving of his own son. And he's pointing us here to the saving action of God as revealing just how great a love that God is. Look at verse 9. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world. In other words, John is telling us that God has shown us his love in the sending of his son to that deadly mission to give us his life. And John goes on to say in verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, here's what John is saying, that God's love is manifested not just in God sending his son in the, into the world, but especially in God's son dying the death on the cross on behalf of all of those who trust in him, center point. That's where John is going to take us. So in dying that death, we are told Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation is not a word that we normally sit over coffee and discuss, right? Like you don't sit with your friends and go, tell me, tell me about the deep truths of propitiation. We don't go there. Some of your Bibles will translate it atonement. That's a great translation. Some of your Bibles will translate it expiation. That's another word that we don't use often. But the biblical word behind the translation, whether, it's your, whether your Bible says expiation, atonement, propitiation, atoning sacrifice, or something else, it means all of those things. But when Jesus propitiates, what it means is he turns away God's wrath. Isn't that beautiful? If you're found in Christ, the wrath of God has been turned away. Propitiation. And that's what Jesus came to do. To cover our sins. To turn away God's wrath. To turn away uh, the just judgment of God against us covering our sins because the sin separated us from fellowship with God so that we would then walk in communion and fellowship with the living God. And that is salvation. Salvation is fellowship with the living God, for God to be our God and for us to be his people. And John is saying that God's love is manifested, that he gave the blood of his own son that we might fellowship with him forever. That's where John goes. And John says, in light of that love, we ought to love one another. So the measure of how we are to love one another, get this, is the father's giving of his son. How are you doing? If that's your measurement when it comes to loving those in the body of Christ. Isn't it interesting that unlike 1 John chapter 2, the emphasis here is on what the Father gave? So John is drawing us, he's reminding us again of how great the heart of love our Father has for us. It's not just that Jesus is giving, is self giving, and that's un, like that's matchless, like that's amazing. But the Father's giving of his own Son is absolutely amazing as well. Third thing, because God's love is made visible in our mutual love, we are to love one another. Verse 12, he gives this third reason. We are to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So you see, John says there that we are to love one another because of the result of the present activity of our loving one another. Now, I know that's as clear as mud when you read through it. So let me explain. God's love, John is arguing in verse 12, is made visible 
when we love one another in the way the Bible tells us to, and because God's love is made visible when we love one another, the way we are called to love one another in the Bible is this. We are to love one another not only as an encouragement to one another, but as a witness to the world that God's love is true. Here's the logic. John is saying, verse 12, that the unseen God, who manifested, who shown himself in the person of his son, Jesus, is also shown when you love one another. That's exactly what John's saying in center point. That is astounding. John is saying that your love, your practical commitment, your selfless self-giving to one another is a standing witness to a lost world of the love of God. So when we started Centerpoint Church, it was May 2010. And there was another church in Montague, Kingsway Christian Fellowship. They were about to close their doors. Their pastor, they couldn't, uh, he was going back to the States. They couldn't afford him anymore. And they were about to close their doors. And some of the people came and they said, Howie, could we be part of Centerpoint? Could we come under the ministry of Centerpoint Church because we, we don't want to see our church die? I said, absolutely. Just have to take that to the people. That goes really well. And we'll try to combine two churches. And in April 2011, Centerpoint Church and Kingsway Christian Fellowship merged together. And guess what happened in our community? The lost, those who could care less about the church and don't go to church, they said, that is the first time we ever seen two Christian churches actually get along. I'm blown away. And I was like, what? That's our, like, John says, a lost world will know your love, will know God's love because of your love for one another. And I'm going, oh, Matt, the Christian church really stinks at loving one another. We really do. Like, Prince Edward Island, like, yeah, I grew up here, so I can say these things, and you can be mad at me, but I'm I'm island born. Like, we're a little slower in what's happening in our in our world, right? I used to joke with people out west that maybe we'll get the internet soon in Prince Edward Island and we'll catch up and all this, because they used to tease me, you're so laid back and but but here's what happens. We become very, uh, I'll just say, we put our walls up in PEI way too much. We, like, even though we don't say it, there are churches who are competing with other churches, or there are churches that are afraid to lose certain people to some churches, and all this craziness goes on all the time. And I started just thinking, like, don't we love Jesus? Don't we all serve the Savior who died on a cross for our sin? Like, shouldn't our goal be to get people to Jesus? Like, my goal is not to get people to center point. Like, I have family. I have a dad who doesn't know Jesus. My goal isn't just to get him to church to a local church, my goal is to see him fall in love with Jesus. And then get connected in a local church. If that's not center point, that's cool. The goal is always to get people to Jesus. We're not about building our own kingdom. We're not about building our own church brands, our own denominations. We should be about just, there are lost people who are dying and going to hell who need to see the love of Christ. And here's our two evangelistic ways to do that that John is going to get at. Number one, it's the biblical word. So it's the word of God. Preach the word. Tell people about how Jesus came, and he came to love them. He came to change them and love the word. That's step one. Just 
love the word. Step number two is this. Love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. John says those are your two ways to do evangelism. And yet our local churches have all these classes like come to this evangelism class and we'll give you seven steps how to win your neighbor to Jesus. And I'm like, just love the word of God and love each other because the lost world is looking at us going, that's what I want. That's what I've been looking for. That's what I've been longing for. Like center point, I would not be standing here, first of all, if it wasn't for the grace of God, but if it wasn't for the way God has used the body of believers in my life. Do you know how many times I just wanted to quit? I just wanted to throw in the towel. But those in the church at the right time, they come and they go, Howie, you're not quitting. God's going to pull you through this. Oh, no, it's hard. I know you're weak, but that's why we're here. Uh, had a lady in Montague, love her to death. And I was sitting, I was having coffee with her and her husband. She said, Howie, in this season of your life, I want you to know this. I believe even when you don't believe. So I believe for you. She gave me the biggest hug ever. I remember driving home that night, and man, I had to pull over my car. I had tears in my eyes, and I'm like, God, you know how close I was to just giving up. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And that's the body of Christ. That's the love in the body of Christ. And if you are not known, and if you do not open up your life, hear me out, people will not know what's going on. So you need to open up. You need to share. And here's the thing. There are things that have happened in my life, and I hate that they have happened, and yet God puts me in situations where he's like, you are going to use that pain, that trial, to help others. And I'm like, I don't like it. God says, you don't have to like it. But if you love the church, you're going to use it. Oh, center point. If only our churches would look and go, let's love each other. Because we know that by loving each other, we will reach a lost and broken world. Oh, Prince Edward Island would be turned upside down like you wouldn't believe. Like, even if Center point, Charlottetown, loved each other like God loves. We would turn this city upside down. We would. Like, I, I have no other way to tell you. Pray, love the word, and love each other. Uh, I'll, I'll close with this. Um, had a friend who was like, Howie, I've been getting to know this person. Uh, he loves sports and I hate sports. But I know you love sports. Can you come to Dooley's and just shoot pool with us? And can you talk to him about Jesus? Because he'll listen. And I said, Absolutely. I suck at pool, but I'll go if we're going to talk about Jesus. So we go to Dooley's, and we connect on a sports level. That's my, my open door. And I won't talk about my favorite team because Darcy said he'd turn off the mic. So we connect in that sport of a particular team I cheer for. We shoot some pool. And then we're sitting on those chairs by the wall. He said, so you're a pastor. Tell me, did you want to do that? And then that led to the very end where I was able just to lay out the gospel. And then I said, you know what, what I just shared with you? You should meet up with your friend this week. And you two should talk about Jesus. See, that's what we do in the church. That's the community. Like, 
There are people who you will connect with really well. There are people who you go, man, we have nothing in common, and that's a lot of work, but it's so worth it if you work at it to love them. And then a lost world is going like, wow, you guys love each other. I want in. I want that. Well, the center point, we'll pray. So I'll invite you to stand. I'll invite our worship team up, and we'll pray and close in song, Heavenly Father. I want to thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. I want to thank you, God, for the love that you have, as your word says, bestowed upon us, that you have given to us, that you have shown to us. And God, I pray that your love would transform us. I pray if there's anyone in this room today who does not know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that you would open up their heart to the truth of the gospel, that right now the Holy Spirit would bring them from darkness to light. I pray for the Christian in the room who's having a hard time loving some Christians in the body of Christ. I pray that you would break their heart. I pray that they would see their measurement is for really how God gave us his son. So God, allow our church, allow our churches to be churches that love like God sending his son to this earth. Oh God, I pray that you would transform us today. In your name we pray. Amen.